A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because you are haughty of heart, you say, a God am I. I occupy a godly throne in the heart of the sea. And yet you are a man, not a God. However, you may think yourself like a god. Oh yes, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is beyond you. By your wisdom and your intelligence, you have made riches for yourself. You have put gold and silver into your treasuries. By your great wisdom applied to your trading, you have heaped up your riches. Your heart has grown haughty from your riches Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have thought yourself to have the mind of a God, therefore I will will bring against you foreigners, the most barbarous of nations. They shall draw their swords against your beauteous wisdom. They shall run them through your splendid apparel. They shall thrust you down to the pit there to die a bloodied corpse in the heart of the sea. Will you then say, I am a God, when you face your murderers? No, you are a man, not a God. Hand it over to those who will slay you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised at the hands of the foreigners. For I have spoken, says the Lord God. Verbum Domini. It is I who deal death and give life. It is I who deal death and give life. I would have said, I will make an end of them and blot out their name from men's memories, had I not feared the insolence of their enemies, feared that these foes would mistakenly boast. Our own hand won the victory. The Lord had nothing to do with it, for they are a people devoid of reason, having no understanding. How could one man rout a thousand, or two men put ten thousand to flight, unless it was because the rock sold them and the Lord delivered them up? Close at hand is the day of their disaster, and their doom is rushing upon them. Surely the Lord shall do justice for his people. On his servants he shall have pity. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matthäum. Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, I say to you, it will be hard for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For men this is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Then Peter said to him in reply, We have given up everything and followed you. What will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you that you who have followed me in the new age, when the Son of Man is seated on his throne of glory, will yourselves sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for the sake of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Verbum Domini. First of all, a warm welcome to Father Fernando and his group who are visiting us from Orlando. Uh, welcome to all of you. Although the first reading today is mainly addressed to the Prince of Tyre, we can see it as addressed to each of us as an examination of conscience, especially when we're tempted to fall into pride. Listen to what the prophet says. And we can see it again addressed to us. Because you are haughty of heart, you say, a God am I. Yet you are a man and not a God. However, you may think yourself like a God. You have made riches for yourself. You have put gold and silver into your treasuries, heaped up your riches. Your heart has grown haughty. But God reminds us here again, you are a man, not a God. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote that there is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine they are guilty themselves. And the more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. And this is very true. When we come across someone who is um, displaying arrogance, we want nothing to do with that. It's been said that pride loves ourselves with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and all our strength, rather than God. He's calling us to love him wholeheartedly. But we know from sacred scripture that he who exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And usually, we can think of our own past experience, when we get puffed up with pride, it's not long before we get humbled. And the Lord brings us back to reality, to see things as they really are. And it's not so much done as a punishment as it is done to lovingly correct us. Again, to see reality, to see things the way they really are and perhaps reflecting particularly on the times that we were humbled or that God permitted some humiliation in our life can really help us to see God's providence along our, each of our own journey in life. If God didn't permit this humbling experience, we might have continued to be puffed up with our own selves, with pride, and not have been open to listen to God's daily invitation to follow him more deeply, to follow him more closely. It couldn't have been planned more perfectly. For God is perfect, and he certainly can bring good, even out of what seems to be evil or bad things. So always expect good to come out of difficult trials that we go through. And as the Catechism reminds us, humility is the foundation for prayer. It's only when we realize that we do not know how to pray as we ought that we're ready to receive the free gift of prayer. Again, prayer is a gift, and we need to ask for it. Now, if we think of the person or persons who have probably had the biggest impact or effect on our lives, more than likely, that is someone or they are people who are truly humble. 
They make the biggest impact on us. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI recounted in his book, God in the World, a conversation he had with a parish priest. And the priest had told him that he had come to his vocation by the particular agency of a priest who was actually bereft of all exterior gifts. He said he was a hopeless preacher, a dreadful singer, and so on. And yet under his care, the parish really blossomed. It flourished. In the end, he said four or five priestly vocations were awakened in the city parish, something that had happened neither under his predecessor nor under his successor, both of whom were far more capable regarding the exterior gifts. So we see the power and witness of true humility in action. It was this priest's humble example that drew these people to Christ, to answer generously the call of Christ. We ask certainly for the grace to grow in humility today, to realize that every good gift is from God, that we are creatures, not God, as again Ezekiel reminds us. We're called to imitate Christ. And remember, as St. Paul said, to have that mind among us, which was in Christ Jesus, to imitate him. That's where our peace and our joy are truly found, in humility and in following Christ. And in the gospel today, we see how difficult our journey can be due to becoming too self-reliant upon ourselves or trusting too much in our wealth or our possessions rather than in God. Again, this is exactly what Ezekiel was talking about in the first reading. We've heaped up for ourselves our own riches. Our trust is in them rather than in God. We become haughty. But the context for today's gospel, when our Lord talks about how difficult it is, especially if we trust in riches and in wealth, the context is, is Jesus had just encountered the rich young man. And he had invited him to follow him more deeply, more closely. But again, he was too attached to his wealth, too attached to his possessions to follow Christ wholeheartedly. And even though the young man was wealthy and he had many things, he obviously wasn't happy. He did not feel fulfilled. He was empty inside. That's what prompted him to ask the Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He knew that there had to be more to this life than just his possessions. Money can't buy authentic peace. It can't buy authentic joy that comes from living the Christian life fully, to living the gospel fully. So the temptation can be to trust in our status, to trust in our wealth, to trust in our possessions, rather than in God alone. So wealth and power can bring a false sense of security. When our Lord gave the comparison that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, St. Matthew tells us the disciples were stunned. (laughs) They were astonished. This prompted them to say, who then can be saved? The Lord took that moment to encourage them that all things are possible with God's grace. And our Lord is not, this is very important, he was not denouncing wealth or riches in themselves, but rather the attachment to wealth, the attachment to what we have. That can be very spiritually dangerous for us. So wealth can be an obstacle to our spiritual growth but it doesn't have to be. Riches are not evil, again, in themselves, and there's nothing wrong with being wealthy and having possessions. In fact, there have been many saints throughout the church's history who were rich, who came from wealthy families who were wealthy themselves, but they saw themselves as being stewards of God's gifts. They were very generous in helping those in need and building up the kingdom of God. So the saints teach us to be very generous in using the gifts we have for the greater glory of God. But this really is something that we should check ourselves on. Am I overly attached to my possessions? Am I clinging inordinately to what I have? Again, is there some obstacle right now to me growing in my relationship with God who's asking me to give him everything, to give him my whole heart? So again, we pray today to grow in the grace of humility, to grow in the grace to to have true detachment from the things that we have, 
that we may use them for the honor and glory of God, but that we may not allow them to be obstacles, that what we possess may not own us, <laughs> that we use them for his honor and glory. And also that, again, we be generous in using the gifts that God has given us to build up the church, to build up the kingdom of God, to draw others closer to Christ. So may we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus as we heard this past Sunday in the letter to the Hebrews and persevere in running the race to reach eternal life with God in heaven.